<coughs> okay, so we've uh, just done the activation process, and now I'm going to go through the inactivation process for sodium channels. So just to remind you, right, that sodium channels and any channels actually we represent as state diagrams. And in this case, the state diagram um, repre is represented in this fashion. And, and if you consult the notes, you'll see why it is that we actually uh, diagram them in this particular way. So in other words, they can actually go closed, can go to an activated, or it can actually go to the open state. And in fact, we're now going to assay the extent to which these channels are actually in this state relative to this state. That's actually what we're going to call the um, assaying the inactivation, um, the probability of being in the inactivated state or um, generating inactivation diagrams. Now, not all, all channels behave like this. And you'll see in the notes, we talk about some other channels that actually have got topologies, you know, such as this. And, and the example that I give you in the notes is the herd channel, right? So it actually also undergoes transitions from closed to open to inactivated. But notice here that the only way that the, ch the channels can get back from the inactivated to the closed state is actually to go back through the open state, okay? So that's something to think about. Uh, right now we're going to focus on a type of channel, and the majority of channels actually behave uh, like this. Um, and we're going to take the example of the sodium channel again uh, and do the inactivation curves. So we talked about before how and I just want to remind you that these closed states, there's actually a bunch of confirmations consistent with the closed state, um, leading ultimately to the open state. And there are several different inactivated states here. Well, we're just, when, when we do a voltage clamp experiment, we can't really tell exactly what closed state it's in, what inactivated state it's in. But we certainly can distinguish between this cluster of, cl of inactivated states versus the cluster of closed states. So how do we go about assaying this? And turns out that if we, we've done the experiment before the activation curves where we step from minus 120, and the reason we chose that voltage, that extremely negative voltage, is because we know from experience that when you go to that very negative potential, the channels are actually not inactivated at all. In fact, every one of the channels is uh, negative enough, and remember this is the voltage sensor now that is, that is uh, feeling the voltage across the memory. And it's really causing energetically these channels to prefer very strongly the closed conformations of the uh, of the protein. Okay, so at minus 120, if we were to step to let's say around plus 10 millivolts, and remember at plus 10 millivolts, I just want to remind you from our activation curve that we just did that under those circumstances we're actually up here, right? We're essentially at the maximum probability of opening as a result of activation. Okay? So the activation gate has gone as much to the open conformation as possible when we go to plus 10 millivolts. Okay? So that's why we're going to choose plus 10 as the uh, test, what we're going to call uh, the test potential. Okay? Um, and the way we actually assay the inactivation process is we say, okay, so we're going to start at minus 120, then we're going to do a series of pre-pulses. And we're going to have these pre-pulses actually for a very long period of time. They're actually going to be for about two seconds. Okay, and then after we're done that two seconds, we're actually going to do a test pulse back up to plus 10. And because we know that at plus 10, all the channels that actually were in the closed conformation, well, virtually every one of them is going to open. Okay? So, um, so all we're going to do now is by going to different pre-pulses here and stepping uh, to, a uh, to a voltage where all the channels are going to open, we can actually figure out to what extent the channels actually are in the closed state relative to the inactivated state as we go between different pre-pulse voltages. Okay, and we'll just see how that, that plays out here in just, uh, just a second. Okay. So if we were to go to um, stay at minus 120, let's say, and then step to 10, here's the current that we would actually record. So we would see nothing, nothing, nothing. And then we would actually see a nice brisk current trace with very brisk inactivation. Okay? So this would actually be at minus 120 holding, right? A uh, pre-pulse. Okay? And this is the amount of current that we see again in response to a step to plus 10. 
Okay. All right. So now if we actually go to um, minus uh, 120, turns out we'd actually see exactly the same amount of current. And the reason is, and I'm just going to redraw my uh, gating diagram here. Okay. And um, what's happened is that all the channels have remained in the closed state. So they've all been capable of actually going to the open state, open confirmation, from which they actually then go to the inactivated state. But now if we go to minus 100 millivolts, we actually find that we're going to pick up less current than we had at minus 110. If we go to minus 90, same thing. Go to minus 80, even less current. Minus 70 even less current, okay, and so this is actually now we're at minus 70 here, and remember, we stepped up plus 10 here, so our driving force is exactly the same, so the only thing that's changing here is our open probability. Well, if we know that all the channels that were in the closed state at plus 10 are going to transition to the open state, the ones that are, that are in the closed state are capable of transitioning to the open state, then we can infer that as we've gotten less and less current here, as we've gone to more and more positive uh, pre-pulse voltages, we've actually lost channels from this closed state. And where have they gone? They've actually gone into this inactivated state. And they've bypassed going to the open state and gone directly to the inactivated state. Now, if I were to look uh, very carefully back here, when I actually step to the pre-pulse, right? Now, I stopped at minus 70. I could have gone to minus 60 and I would have picked up a little bit more current or a little bit less current, but I still get a little bit of current there. Now if I actually step to minus 50, we have to remember here that I actually will get some current activating here and then activating. Okay. And when I come over to here at minus 50, actually turns out I'll still pick up a little bit of current here. Okay. So in other words, all these channels haven't yet made it over, although it looks as though we're very close to the to the closed confirmation here, or uh, to the zero current line, there actually will be a wee bit of current. Sometimes it's called a window current, but regardless. Now, we've kept the driving force exactly the same. So if we use the same trick we used when we talked about the activation curve, right, the probability of the channel actually being opened is just going to be the peak current divided by the driving force, Vm minus E rev. Okay. Well, this happens to be a constant, right? We step to plus 10 each time. So this driving force was a constant. Okay, so what that tells us is that the open probability is actually just going to be proportional to the peak current. Okay, and that's what we're going to plot. And that is the, turns out, under these conditions. And what we're going to do is we're going to plot this open probability, actually, as a function of the uh, current uh, that we record at the pre-pulse voltage. Okay, so that's going to tell us the extent to which the channels are actually in the open, in the, in the, um, in the um, so we're assaying the number of channels that are actually in the activated state, remaining in the closed state, therefore not in the inactivated state, at these different potentials. Okay, so the, the peak open probability now for the sodium channel at minus 120, we're going to start at minus 120, pre-pulse, well, it's... The probability was zero when we trans. Or probability was one when we transitioned to um, to 10 millivolts. Right? Went to minus 10, uh, minus 110, minus 120, or minus 100. We started to get less current, less current, less current, less current, less current. Okay, and eventually we got down to about minus 50 millivolts when we actually got essentially no current any longer, and from there. We actually, indeed, when we transition to the to, to uh, plus 10 millivolts, we actually see no current. So this is what we call the H infinity curve, or the inactivation curve. And what it is, is it's the probability of not being in the inactivated state. So we actually, to know whether what the probability is being in the inactivated state, we actually take 1 minus H infinity, and that's actually proportional to the probability of being in the inactivated state. And again, H infinity is actually the probability of not being in the inactivated state, so it's the probability of being in the closed state. Okay, so that's that's inactivation curves, and um, good luck. <laughs>